So there's a lot of positive stuff from David's life that we can learn. I want to shift things this morning and you'll see that David had some areas in his life where he wasn't perfect. And we can also learn from that. You realize sometimes we can learn from what people do right, but we can also learn from what people do wrong. And the fact of the matter is, David struggled with raising children. He struggled in his family. And so we want to look at some of the stuff that he did there, and maybe we can learn some stuff and apply it to our own life. So I want to talk about David, but more specifically, I want to talk about David's son, Absalom. Absalom, you need to know, was David's third son. The second son died, though, so actually Absalom was second in line for the throne. The oldest son's name was Amnon, and he was a half-brother of Absalom. Absalom and Amnon had different moms, but the same dad. And I'm giving you the Reader's Digest abbreviated version of the passage this morning. You can find it. It starts in 2 Samuel 13 and it goes for about four or five chapters. I would encourage you to read that because it's a very interesting story. Anyways, the oldest, Amnon, lusts after his half-sister, Tamar, who is Absalom's full sister. He lusts after her, and he manipulated things so he could be alone with her. And when he's alone with her, he rapes his half-sister. And then after he's raped her, he rejects her. And David's response to this is found in 2 Samuel 13. It says, when King David heard about this, he became very angry. But David didn't punish his son, Amnon. He favored Amnon because he was his firstborn son. Absalom wouldn't speak at all to Amnon. He hated Amnon for raping his sister, Tamar. This terrible thing happened in David's family, and David didn't do anything about it. He ignored it. And I can just see... Um, it talks about how David didn't do anything because he knew Amnon was next in line after him for the kingship. And so David isn't going to do anything to rock the boat to, to hurt his eldest son becoming king. He doesn't do anything. He ignores it. And of course, Absalom is furious about what's happened to his sister. And Absalom didn't do anything right away about it either. I believe he just sat back and he watched. And he saw that nothing was going to happen to Amnon. And so what does he do? He manipulates some circumstances and gets Amnon in a place where he can kill him. And he kills his brother. And then he flees from the area. And David doesn't do anything. He doesn't reconcile. He doesn't confront. And after three years, he's basically done grieving for his oldest son. And he starts to miss Absalom. And so, through some more circumstances, David invites his son Absalom to come back to Jerusalem, to where David is. And so Absalom comes back, but it's another two years before David will even meet with him. He lets him come back to Jerusalem. He doesn't force any consequences upon him, but he just ignores him for a total of five years because of everything that's happened here. Quite a family, eh? Five years, no contact with his father. And after Absalom gets back from three years of being gone and then two more years without any contact from his father living in the same city, Absalom starts up a campaign 
to take the kingdom away from David. And I don't know when he started, whether he had this in mind or not, but it kind of grew into that. In 2 Samuel 15, verses 1 to 6, you see Absalom being back in Jerusalem, and you can see what he's doing here. It says, soon after this, Absalom acquired a chariot, horses, and 50 men to run ahead of him. Absalom used to get up early and stand by the road leading to the city gate. When anyone had a case to be tried by King David, Absalom would ask, which city are you from? After the person had told him which tribe in Israel he was from, Absalom would say, your case is good and proper, but the king hasn't appointed anyone to hear it. And he would add, I wish someone would make me judge in the land. Then anyone who had a case to be tried would come to me, and I would make sure that he got justice. When everyone approached him and bowed down, Absalom would reach out, take hold of him, and kiss him. And this is what he did for all the Israelites who came to the king to have him try their case. So Absalom stole the hearts of the people of Israel. And if you follow the story through, you'll see that he starts a rebellion against David. And David has to flee for his life from the city of Jerusalem. And Absalom, after David has left, Absalom comes into the city to take over. And then something out of an X-rated movie happens as well. What Absalom does to make himself really disgust, disgustable, <laughs> really um, onerous to David, is he takes ten concubines. When David left the city of Jerusalem, he left ten concubines in the city to look after the palace. And so what does Absalom do? He sets up a tent on the rooftop of the palace, And in front of everybody, he sleeps with these ten concubines. Not an average type story where we talk about God's love and God's grace and His goodness. But I'm so glad that there are stories like this in Scripture because it helps us see the reality of things sometimes. So after the concubine thing, Absalom takes some bad advice and he doesn't instantly pursue David and finish him off. And so David regroups and a war is fought and 20,000 men are killed. 20,000 families didn't have a husband and a father to come home to them. And then against David's direct command, Absalom is killed. And the story doesn't end there, but then there's more opportunity for a wedge to be driven between David's top leaders And one of them is killed, and then a short-term rebellion against David takes place, and then another person is killed. All of this stuff happened in David's life. David got so much stuff right. But the family side of things, he didn't get right. So what can we learn from this tragic tale that I've talked about? The first thing that we can learn is we need to deal with issues in life. You see, David ignored what his eldest son Amnon did, and he was hoping that it would just go away. But the fact of the matter is it didn't go away, and it got worse, and it grew until it came to the place where 20,000 men lost their lives because this whole thing was ignored by David. David wouldn't confront his oldest son 
And it just grew, the issue grew and grew and grew. You see, the fact of the matter is, if we don't confront issues, if we don't confront issues in life, we will have to confront them at a later time when we don't like the consequences, where we're forced to confront at a later time. It's pretty quiet in here this morning. I wonder why. You know, David rationalized that it would be better if he didn't confront. And we have to make sure that we don't rationalize in our lives as well. It's so easy to rationalize. Confronting is always hard when it comes to stuff. And let me throw in for free here this morning. There's some things that you need to confront. Where there's grievous sin, you need to confront it and you need to deal with it. But there's other times when things are minor that you just need to overlook them. You know, if your wife is squeezing the toothpaste the wrong way, ignore it. And I'm being a little sarcastic here. But there's some things that you need to overlook, but there's also many things in life that you need to confront. And if you're not willing to confront them, you will pay the price later on. If it's grievous sin, it can't be covered up. And this needs to happen especially in leadership, and especially if a person is in a leadership position, the sin can't be covered up. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he said, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless he's brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Those who are leaders who sin are to be rebuked publicly. You know, if I really mess up in life, I need to be rebuked publicly. Could I get one weak amen on that one? And Paul says to keep these instructions, and he says it in the strongest possible way. He says, I charge you in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus and to the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality. We don't like to confront. We don't like to deal with issues. But we need to. We need to deal with stuff. David didn't do this. If David would have just dealt with Amnon right away, I believe this whole thing could have went away. I believe Amnon would have suffered the consequences for what he did, and I believe it would have given Absalom the opportunity to reconcile to his dad, and Absalom probably would have become king. Probably. But because David was not willing to confront the situation, it just got worse and worse and worse. The second thing that we can learn from this is that we need to deal with unforgiveness and bitterness regardless of whether life is fair or not. The fact of the matter is life is not fair. Life is not fair. And what happened to Tamar was its tragedy of the worst kind. But Absalom made a mistake when he would not let it go. Verse 22 of 2 Samuel 13 says, Absalom wouldn't speak to Amnon. He hated Amnon for raping his sister Tamar. Talk about a grievous, grievous offense. And yet, look at the cost. Look at the consequences because Absalom wouldn't forgive. Because he allowed unforgiveness and bitterness to grow in his heart. In Hebrews 12.15, it says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. 
Many people become defiled through unforgiveness and holding on to things. It doesn't just stop with the original offense. Most times it grows and it spreads. And many people suffer the consequences. Many people hurt and lives are destroyed because of the offense that has happened. This thing is a tragedy, and when we read this story, our heart breaks. And you know, we can justify to ourselves, well, this thing is so bad, this thing that happened to me or this thing that happened to my friend is so bad that I can't get over it. And yet I want you to know that you can get over it. And I want to explain this morning something that will hopefully help you to get over it. You see, we can't say to ourselves, this is so bad that I can't get over it. This is so bad that I'm not going to deal with it because if we don't deal with it, it will deal with us. And it will steal our heritage and it will steal our children's heritage and it will steal, it has a real opportunity to steal our friend's heritage, and the issue just goes on and on and on. We need to forgive. We can't just say that the thing is too bad that we don't want to deal with it. You know, what can help with this? I want to take you to something that you think you already know, but I want to maybe present it to you from a little different point of view. You know, when Jesus went to the cross and he suffered and died, I want you to see that he bore that grievous sin upon himself. The fact of the matter is that sin is paid for. And when something terrible happens to us, what we need to do is we need to take this terrible, grievous thing to Jesus Christ. And with His strength, we can forgive. We all know this stuff. At least I think we we do. We know this stuff, but we have a hard time appropriating what Jesus Christ did to to ourselves. And we forget the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price for that grievous sin. You see, we think that Jesus paid the price for the perpetrator. We think that Jesus paid the price for the person who committed the grievous sin. But the fact of the matter is Jesus paid the price for that sin as well for the person who was offended, for the person who was hurt. And in doing so, he made the way so that we can forgive. You know, we we tend to think that it's for the perpetrator, but no, it's for the person that's offended too. You need to see that that price the cost of that terrible thing that happened to you or happened to somebody else, the cost of that thing was paid for on the cross. The cost was paid for so you can forgive and so you can experience freedom from that thing. Yes, the perpetrator will face judgment someday. If he doesn't repent sincerely and give his life to Jesus Christ, God is going to hold him accountable. This is a tougher message than I thought it was going to be. I want you to see that if you've been hurt this morning, 
I want you to see that Jesus Christ paid the price for that thing that hurt you so that you can be set free. Don't run too quick to the other side of the equation. The other side of the equation is if the person who's committed the thing, if they sincerely go to Jesus Christ and they ask for forgiveness, yes, they can be forgiven and they can experience all the grace and the goodness of God. But don't go there too quick. Understand that Jesus Christ paid the price so that you can be set free. Understand that there was a price that was paid for that thing that was done to you. Let's move on to my third point. And that is to stay in community. Don't let anything cause you to isolate yourself from other people. David isolated himself from his son Absalom for a period of five years. And look at the consequences. You know, the fact of the matter is, writing people off is the easy way to handle things. Writing people off and distancing yourself from other people is the easy way to handle things. And yes, sometimes situations are so bad that you have to remove yourself from that situation. If you've been abused or you are being abused, you have to remove yourself from that situation so that you can be whole and so that you can be healthy. But I'm not talking about that this morning. What I'm talking about is when we're hurt and we're offended, the easiest thing for us to do is to remove ourselves from that situation. And all of our protection mechanisms that we know go up instantly and we just isolate ourselves from a situation like that. The problem is with that approach is that we isolate ourselves from other people. We shouldn't do that. David isolated himself from his son Absalom. He made himself inaccessible to Absalom and look at the price that was paid. 20,000 men lost their lives because David refused to, to see Absalom and, you know, refused to reconcile with his son. We tend to isolate ourselves from other people way too quickly. And if we're going to stay with other people, It's not fun, and it's not pleasant all of the time. But once again, the stuff needs to be worked through. The stuff needs to to be worked through. Some issues in life, there's not going to be reconciliation. Some issues in life, you are never going to agree with other people. But that doesn't mean that you have to isolate yourself from them. That doesn't mean that you can never... Um, break bread, have communion with people like that. Sometimes we just have to let go things. Come on, we all know in marriages there's a lot of things that you just need to let go of, right? But the same is true in our relationship with other people. Some things you will never be able to agree on, but that doesn't mean that you need to isolate yourself from them just because you disagree on them. Oh my goodness, if if I would let us get into conversations about politics or I would let are us get into conversations about so many issues that we've got going on right now. You know, this church would be divided into 327 factions of, of the 200 people that attend. You may question my math, but... (laughs) 
You see, we isolate ourselves way too soon. We isolate ourselves way too soon. We have a problem, and do you know what the problem is? Part of the reason that we isolate ourselves from other people is when something bad happens to us, and I'm not talking about your toast is burnt, but when something grievous happens to us that's a life-changing event that happens to us, we tend to, or what's easy for us to do, is to view the rest of life through the lens of what's happened to us. So somebody rejects you. You go around looking to be rejected. And in looking to be rejected, you know what you find? Rejection all over the place, whether it was intended or not. I've pastored a couple different churches now. And when I'm a new pastor coming into a church, do you know how I'm viewed? I'm viewed through the lens of what happened in the church before, whether good or bad. We do this in life. We experience a tragic event, and then it's easy for us to spend the rest of our life viewing every circumstance, every person, every issue that comes along through the lens of that very thing. And in doing so, we find offense all over the place, and we isolate ourselves, and we try to protect ourselves from that thing, and it isn't even really happening to us, but we're just assuming that it's going to, and we're looking for it, and we find it, and it's not a positive thing. Let's just put it that way. God calls us to live in community. Let's shift gears for a moment. You see, for us, we need to understand too, it's so easy for us to see other people reject us. It's so easy for us to see um, other people assume that we have motives that we absolutely don't have. Why? Because they're viewing us through the lens of things that have happened in their life. So what we need to do is have grace for people. You know, there's a saying that goes, you can't help but hurt hurting people. And so, what that means is if somebody is hurting there isn't, let me put it this way, if somebody is hurting, it's very easy for you to hurt them, whether you intended to or whether you actually did or not. It's very easy for you to experience hurt yourself because they're viewing you as if you're the herder. Does that make any sense? So what do we have to do? We have to have grace in times like that. We absolutely have to have grace with other people. Yes, they're seeing me this way. I'm not going to be, we need to make the decision, I'm not going to be offended because they're seeing me this way. I'm going to make the decision that I'm going to love them anyways. I'm not going to isolate myself from them because they're prickly but I am going to stay in communion. David isolated himself from Absalom, and the consequences were immense. We need to make sure that we stay in communion with each other. We need to make sure that we don't let events cloud us, cloud our judgment, cloud our thinking in life. God calls us to live in communion, and He wants us to have close communion, close fellowship with each other. Church is so, so, so important. Rick Warren says the church is the greatest force on earth. 
Bill Hybel says the local church is the hope of the world. And I absolutely believe what these guys say is true. You see, the fact of the matter is, there isn't any better way to experience the love of God. There isn't any better way to experience the grace of God. There isn't any better way to experience the goodness of God than in church. Now, do churches get it right all the time? Absolutely not. The thing that can do the most good sometimes does the most harm. And it's a terrible thing, but that's just reality in life. But does that mean we should isolate ourselves from church? Absolutely not, because when we isolate ourselves from the harm, at the same time we're, ab- we're isolating ourselves from the goodness. We're isolating ourselves from the plan that God has for us. This stuff is so crucial, people, that I want to talk about it this morning because we need to understand that if we're going to take territory from Satan, we need to work together. And if we're going to work together, we have to make the choice that we're going to do these things that I've talked about this morning. We need to make sure if we're going to work with other people, we need to make sure that we confront issues that absolutely need to be confronted. We need to deal with issues that need to be dealt with. It's true in marriage. You can't just sweep major stuff under the carpet. You have to deal with it. You have to talk about it with each other. And you don't talk about it when you're mad at each other. You talk about it when you're so tired that you can't even think straight. Three o'clock in the morning type stuff. At least that's the way it is for Joyce and myself. But the moral of the story is what I'm trying to say is we have to deal with stuff. We have to deal with issues. We can't just assume grievous sin is going to go away. And you know, Most of the time, if we would just deal with it, if we would just go to the person and talk to the person, we'd find out that there isn't an issue anyway. The second thing we need to do, like I've mentioned, I'm wrapping up now, is we need to deal with unforgiveness and bitterness. Let me give you a little trick for this. I guess I'm preaching, going through the points twice here, but I I think this is important. When you've messed up, or somebody perceives that you've messed up, what you need to do is go to them and ask for forgiveness. And don't make excuses for your behavior. Don't say, I treated you this way, but the reason I treated you this way is because you did this to me. And you know what? I wouldn't have done that if you wouldn't be such an idiot yourself to start with. (laughs) That's not how you reconcile. How to reconcile is to go to the other person and to say, you know what? I really messed up here. I'm sorry, and take responsibility and take the blame for that thing that you did that was wrong. And I can guarantee you, in any disagreement, there's two sides to the story. And then another little trick that I learned, that I used to use on Joyce, but now she uses on me too, so life isn't fair. Ask the other person if they'll forgive you. Joyce, I really messed up. I didn't, everybody. We're pretending. (laughs) Well, anyways. But Joyce, I've really messed up. Would you forgive me? I really messed up. I haven't been a good husband for the last 72 years. Would you, would you forgive me? And when she says yes, 
when she says yes, that cements something in her life as well too. And then the chances are the issue is over and done. You know, that's just a, that's just a simple little trick. You can apply that to your kids. Sammy, would you go do this? Get him to say yes. 90% greater chance he'll go do it. To deal with unforgiveness and bitterness, ask, accept responsibility, ask for forgiveness, and then get the other person to say, I forgive you. And the third thing is that we need to stay in community. Community is hard. Community um, can cause a lot of damage. But from the story I read to you this morning, you can see the consequences of not staying in community. A dad who wrote off his son, that caused incredible damage in his life. You know, us as parents, we need to be the mature ones we need to be the ones that, that deal with some of this stuff and that are willing to, willing to take the hurt and are willing to take the abuse. I so love my own father because my own father could just work in a situation and absolve the thing instantly. I was always amazed at how he could do that. When I was in my 20s and I was mad at one of my sisters for something, and dad would come in in just a few sentences, the whole thing was gone. And I'm happy to say that I'm in fellowship basically with all of my sisters today There's, and my brother today. In fact, I'm probably closer to them today than I have been when I was growing up. God is good. Let's make these choices, people. And in making these choices, we can take territory from the enemy, and we will not only take territory from the enemy, but we will keep the territory that we take. Let's bow our heads and pray.